animals. <laughs> animals, am I right, guys? Animals are so cool, man. There's like all sorts of them, and sometimes you can even lose count of how many there are. Some could even say there's like one for literally every type of person out there. Look at this guy, look at his nose, look at- it's so funny, and look at that guy! Animals are so cool, they even often make appearances in popular media, including, surprisingly enough, video games. Popular examples include, uh, I don't know, Minecraft, uh, Hat in Time, Gex, Enter the Gecko. I give a little back. But this is not a variety channel, this is a Genshin Impact channel, and as such, I'm here to talk about not the animals themselves, but the quote, non-human characters roaming the lands of Teyvat. Unless you want me to talk about the actual animals. This is a pigeon. <laughs> Firstly, what even defines to me a non-human character? Well, it's simple really. A non-human character is a character with distinct traces of non-human blood or characteristics in them, which are most often unrealistic, hence my introduction, but nevertheless feature some really interesting outliers, which I will also be talking about. Hey listen, alright, I know there's still very much humans, but shut up! That's not what the icebreaker creature said. I'll be going down this list however I see fit because fuck you, this is my channel and I do things the way I want, starting with... Definitely a curious one to start this video with. At a glance, Albedo doesn't really show any particular signs of being a non-human. He really just looks like every other Josh Moen monster, so... What makes him so special then? Well, if you ever paid attention to Genshin Impact theories, you may know that ever since Albedo was introduced, he was theorized to be not human, or at least not entirely. This was eventually confirmed in a 2.3 limited time quest from Shadow Amid Snowstorms, in which he himself states, like a self-aware Freddy Fazbear animatronic, that he is a homunculus, an artificial intelligence created by what we can consider the greatest mind in alchemy, Zosimus of Panopolis, who mastered the control of the art of life creation using the powerful but volatile art of Kamiya, and I am not talking about Ryan Daughter, so forget this guy for a moment, he's not really that important, he just, you know, contributed more to modern science and alchemy than you or I ever could. Did you know that Kamiya is, or rather was, a real thing? Of course, not in the same way as Genshin Impact portrays it, but it was how alchemy was known way back when your mom was born, and it was this guy Zosimus who compiled all knowledge about Kamiya at the time in a 28 volume collection. That is wild. Ryan Dada was a mysterious but elusive and legendary figure from 500 years ago, most notably one of the main forces behind the Cataclysm, which destroyed Conria and affected the entirety of Teyvat, causing many casualties throughout all nations and goddammit, I'm getting tired of mentioning this in all my videos. She also went by the name Gold, which is obviously far less enticing than Ryan Dada. The Albedo we know is not the first of its kind either. He's the second one, wow, as revealed in, again, 2.3. What we call Primordial Albedo was the first Albedo created by Ryan Daughter as a result of her Primordial Human Project. He is only distinguishable from our Albedo, appearance-wise by the lack of a star shape in his neck, and behavior-wise by maniacal and murderous tendencies. He was however deemed a failure, and was swallowed up by Jiren, escaped after the dragon crash into Dragonspine, and took the mountain as his residence, analyzing how Albedo lives amongst common humans and growing increasingly more envious, before concocting a plan and lashing out at the Traveler's party. It's not over yet! Researching about Albedo made me realize he is a really interesting character who unfortunately took such a long time to be fully developed lore and personality wise. Back when he was released, me and a lot of people weren't really able to get very attached to his character apart from having a very cool design undeniably, and it didn't really help that he was one of the first defense based characters along with the true Geo Archon, so it's unfortunate that a lot of people, including me, missed out on his banners when they were present. Hell, we may have laughed at Albedo Havers back in 2020, but who's laughing now? Grandes éxitos de los 60. 60 onde, filha da p. So gross. Continuing in the same vein of non human alchemist big brains, we now pass the baton to Albedo's assistant, who specializes in and has made great contributions to the field of bioalchemy, Sucrose. <laughs> No one really seems to know what animal she's supposed to represent, both in-game and in the community, people still seem to debate that. The only clue, if you can even call it that, is that she won't suppose herself to be from the same lineage as Diona, given that both have hereditary characteristics, but found that out to be untrue, so you could maybe theorize that she's a cat. Sucrose is like a kid in an adult's body, filled with a burning passion and curiosity about life and its secrets, but unlike actual kids, she's not fucking annoying, stupid, and useless. 
She often finds herself spending copious amount of time researching about topics she's passionate in or interested in regardless of how useful the final results may be, and like your average Redditor spending 25 hours a day online, she's terrible at talking and interacting to other people and has a collection of bones in her home. H including including Hilichurls. These were humans, by the way. Even other characters have remarked on Sucrose's weird infatuation with seemingly useless research, some even going as far as to create rumors about her research lab and the experiments she conducts, although Jean seems not to care, and if Jean doesn't care, who am I to not comply and also not care? Unlike her tutor Albedo, who focuses on creating life, she goes more down the road of modifying existing life in order to add more variety to this world. However, she considers this more as the gradual steps she needs to take in order to achieve her major and ambitious dream, not paying taxes. I mean, creating her own little paradise where everything is perfect and where she doesn't have to pay taxes. Well, okay, I say this jokingly, I think, but the reason as to why she wants to create this paradise for herself is not like Redditors wanting to purchase an island in Cuba? What the fuck? SHUT THE FUCK but UP! Also, YOU SHUT THE FUCK UP! As the story goes like this. Sucrose had two friends. The end. Sucrose had two friends. Great friends, even. They were basically siblings. And one day, they heard of a mysterious place somewhere in Teyvat where there were pink flowers the size of a house and an orange midget, and then promised to each other that they would one day visit this place. But like famous rapper and... Oh my god. NFT enthusiast Eminem once said... Because one, the place is probably not even real, and two, things could go bad at any moment. And if they hadn't gone wrong, I wouldn't be telling this story. One of her friends left on a journey with her adventure parents and was never ever seen again by anyone in Mondstadt. And the other had such a drastic change in personality after her father passed away that she broke off all relations with Sucrose and said they would never meet again. What? Well, because Sucrose is definitely the best out of the three friends, even though we don't even know who they are, to honor and fulfill their promise, Sucrose then set about studying bioalchemy and creating her personal paradise, just like the one she heard about so long ago. Even though most of Sucrose's experiments have little to no practical use outside of fueling and satiating her own imagination, some did prove to be really useful like the NRE, which even features a design similar to hers. The way it works is that you put the food in, some magic happens, and ta-da, all the flavor, texture, and richness is gone and you're left with only nutritional substance, which is then directly injected into your bloodstream every two seconds. Maybe now you can see why most people are against using this. Also in the same vein of experiments, when the gods oh so graciously gifted Sucrose with one of the most desired gadgets in all of Teyvat, a vision with which she could come- a vision with which she could manipulate the power of Animo. She didn't give a single shit and went back to experimenting with thin lion seeds and actually tried to boil her instrument. What's with people who actually earn visions and not taking the slightest care with them? You got so many people out there who want them and the gods decide to give people who don't even know or care about what a vision can grant them. Thankfully, they're indestructible. You know who else is indestructible? Good thing I'm indestructible. Ito's non-human characteristics are way more noticeable than Albedo's or even Sucrose's, but still very distinct from the other non-humans in this list. That is because he is an Oni, an ancient and powerful race predating the Cataclysm but who lived a secluded lifestyle in Inazuma due to humans fearing them or, in other words, there is blatant racism in my video game. We learn a lot about the Oni race from Ito's story quest, which even if it started in a... Somewhat low note. It eventually managed to develop into an amazing tale, but most importantly for this video, it tells us a lot about the Oni race and how they interact with humans in old times. The Oni clans value their principles and pride very much, which have been passed down from generation to generation. They have long horns, obviously, and larger physical strength and build than most common humans. Not Ito though. Look how they mask with my boy. And in the distant past, had completely blue or crimson skin with no markings, which have since dwindled when Oni started to reproduce with humans. <laughs> Pop quiz. Get this right and win some candy, which I will never give you. What is the weakness of these large, burly, m massive creatures? And that's time! Let's see what you answered. Damn. You wanna talk about it? Hey, fellas, sorry for that small delay. Let's finally reveal the answer now. And the answer was. Bang! 
Lions, what the fuck? Yeah, for such a mighty and proud race, they sure have a weird ass choice for weakness. Like, come on. I'm South American. Like, natively. I live here. Unfortunate, I know. We eat rice with beans every day, guys. It's not that bad. Smoky barbecue bacon Buford from Checkers? Mmm. Uh, that's your boss. Ito's story quest also tells of an Inazuman fairy tale regarding two Oni. The red one who wished to interact with the humans, and the blue one who wished to remain in his secluded life. After a few attempts of socializing with humans from the red Oni, the blue Oni eventually came up with a plan, where it would perform evil acts and have the red Oni scare him off. This ended up working. Well boys, we did it. Racism is no more. And thus, the red Oni began interacting with humans, while the blue Oni left. The Red One searched high and low for his friend, only to realize he was purposely being avoided. Seeing this, the Red Oni left a letter and they managed to reunite during a village festival. It's a cute story actually, isn't it? Which is offset by the fact that, because the Blue Oni remains secluded, they are thought to have mostly died off. Nowadays, we know of other Oni like Mikoshi Chiyo, who was in fact introduced before Ito, a legendary figure of pre-Cataclysm and Azuma who died in battle, and others we meet in Ito's story quest, which have continued to live in tribes. Ito is the representative of the Crimson Oni, while Takuya is one of the blue Oni who survived, albeit in extremely poor conditions. Upon learning of this, Ito pledged to help the blue Oni however he can. I wanted to make a joke about Ito being released from prison here, but it seems like he's already served his time. Either that, or he hired some crazed lawyer to somehow release him of his troubles. I don't think that's supposed to work though. <laughs> oh yeah, I watched Better Call Saul last week. <laughs> Yanfei is a Saul Goodman of Chinese video games, the 1900 save my ass of Genshin Impact. Without all the corruption and criminal schemes, probably. An expert in all things a lawyer should be an expert in, like volleyball and unironically cheap posing in 2022, Yanfei is also one of the many characters to have adeptal blood flowing through her veins, which, in this case, manifests as weird ears which, at a glance, I wouldn't blame you for not knowing what they represent. Yanfei was born out of a common human mother and a pure-blooded illuminated beast stad. Don't ask me how that works, as I would prefer that the question remains unanswered. And seems to actually be the youngest adeptus in Liwa, given that her mother is still alive, unlike Ganyu, who is a boo. <laughs> Yanfei's father is likely as Yezi, which looks like this, making me wonder even more what her mother was thinking when she took that decision. Oh god, I just made myself think about it. Yeah, I've seen worse stuff on the internet. The Jieji is described as a righteous beast, often used as a symbol of justice and law which are painted all over Yanfei's character. They are also depicted as ox or goat-like creatures with a single long horn who, in a debate or legal confrontation, will point out the faulty party by either ramming them with its horn or biting them, which Yanfei thankfully doesn't do. Even if someone out there is turned on by that. From a very young age, she took a huge interest in studying, which eventually led her to becoming Liwei's top legal advisor, easily finding loopholes in the law, which Ningguang then corrects with her help, and more often than not, pulling win-win scenarios for her customers, except for divorces. <laughs> Remember guys, don't get married. What the fuck? It must be noted that despite being an adeptus, she has never signed a contract with Morax and has no formal alliance established with Liwa. Meaning that she could use her power and knowledge about loopholes in the legal system for illegal misdoings, but rather chooses to help humans and do everything she wants out of the good of her heart and money. And by the way, she can talk. A lot. Literally, no character in this game, not even the exposition machine that is Paimon, or Albedo, the playable character with the most voice lines in the game, is as much of a blubbermouth as Yanfei is. She loves the baiting, which is an integral part of her job, obviously, but chooses not to go the same political road as Ning Wong, for example, and instead focuses on her backup plan of eventually becoming a rapper. You would think I'm joking, right? But I'm not. <laughs> Yanfei, however, is but one of the many limited beasts of Liwa, and is not even the one with the highest ranking role in the city. That title would belong to my main DPS of choice, Ganyu. Ganyu's clothes are described as blessed by the Illuminated Beast specifically for her, and I gotta say, literally what a high-ranking political figure in the city needs. Ganyu is the GOAT. Literally. And figuratively. Being a character with adeptal blood flowing through her veins, like Yanfei and others in this list, she also inherited the pretty apparent characteristic of having animal features, and in her specific case, goat horns and weird hair. Who's styling the hair for these characters? I, I just want to talk to you for a moment. I should mention though, being part Adeptus or even full Adeptus is not a guarantee to have animal characteristics as we will see later on. Ganyu is, like Yanfei, not a pure-blooded illuminated beast but half-human, half-chilling. 
The description of the Qilin in Chinese mythology varies a lot from place to place and dynasty to dynasty, but Genshin Impact seems to take the Buddhist influence depictions of which are purely vegetarian beasts who refuse to harm any animal and are extremely pacifist and benevolent in nature. And Ganyu, like the Chilean Buddhism, is quiet, soft, and gentle in nature and is often extremely worried about her diet. Zhang herself states that Ganyu is a surprisingly strict vegetarian, with a surprisingly large appetite as much as she craves tasty foods instead of salads. Literally, this bitch only drinks spring water. But riddle me this then, if the Chilling are supposed to be pacifists, why the bloody melt does Ganyu- Ganyu has been alive for thousands of years, being one of the oldest current residents of Liyue Harbor. She fought alongside with Morax in the Archon War and saw the rise of the city after the Wheelie Plains were destroyed, and also likely campaigned against the forces of the Cataclysm which invaded the Chasm and Dunyu Ruins. Look, I was even gonna make the joke when Ganyu choked the dragon after she got stuck in its throat because her ass was so fat, but <laughs> one, everyone's already made that joke, and two, it wasn't even because of that. It was because of her waistline. She was fat. Like most Illuminated Beasts, apart from the lazy fuck that is Yanfei, Ganyu has indeed signed a contract with Morax shortly after the Archon War ended, in which she swears to protect Liyue and its people. This behavior is reflected in her helping the Traveler in Ningguang during both times when a sea monster attacked the city. Although if I had the adeptal power she does, along with the vision, I would also try, at least, to defend my city? Unlike a certain someone who failed to show up. Twice. She is employed by the Liwei Chising, acting as the general secretary as she has been ever since Liwei Harbor was founded. And like most female figures employed in a higher ranked role in their respective nations, she is as overworked as a physician, which led her to become increasingly more nervous, forgetful, stressed, and prone to making mistakes when given a task or just falling asleep entirely. Hey, I also do that. But instead of being a highly ranked and esteemed political figure in my country, I sit in my room writing scripts and playing game dev tycoon. Still, she refuses to take even the shortest of vacations, yet still has time to hang out with the siblings. How brave. Ganyu also struggles a lot when prompted with a very specific decision. Being the general secretary of Yuei High Pavilion, but at the same time a gentle and reclusive illuminated beast, does she wish more to stay in the presence of humans in a busy, bustling city, or to live her life amongst the rest of the Adepti in the mountains of Liwe? For thousands of years, her mindset has wavered between both halves of her lifestyle, still unsure of what route to take. On one hand, the Chilling find it difficult to comprehend pure blood mortals. Despite that, Ganyu would still not consider distancing to be a good thing. The human in her reminds to always hold out for hope that she might, one day, be able to fit in amongst the sea of people in the city blessed by the sea. Also, do you know she's acquainted with Yai Miko? That's neat! Some may even call this a transition. Lord have mercy. We must stay focused, brothers. We must. Stay full. Yai Miko is a kitsune who oversees the largest religious shrine in Inazuma, home to the sacred Sakura, the Grand Narukami Shrine. And also she's a nasty and cynical weeb. Present all throughout Miko's character are fox-like traits because, as some of you may know due to other examples like Pokemon and Baby Metal, in Japanese, kitsune literally means fox, but in Japanese folklore, kitsune are portrayed as foxes who possess superhuman abilities which grow stronger as they age, and, according to yokai folklore, which Miko also is part of, Kitsune are often portrayed as evil or mischievous spirits who have the ability to shapeshift into human forms, and have a lifespan longer than that of normal humans. And even though she refuses to show her fox home to the Traveler, all of these traits are very clearly present in Yai Miko's character. And apparently this is also why she likes striked tofu so much. Yai Miko is a descendant of the Hakushin clan, created by Hakushin, namesake of that one catalyst that everyone definitely uses, who was also a kitsune. Adding to that, another kitsune we have current knowledge of, apart from the actual foxes roaming in Azuma, is the kitsune Saigu. The kitsune Saigu, seen here, is one of the only non-playable characters in the game who looks like she should absolutely be playable. However, she's dead. Doesn't seem like being alive is the criteria though. Saigo was a close ally of A hundreds of years ago and campaigned with the force from Inazuma against the invading beasts of the Cataclysm. Most of what we know about her is related to the weapon I mentioned previously, the Hakushin Ring, whose description narrates her life and also from a world quest called the Sacred Sakura Cleansing Ritual. Like all Kitsune, Saigo had a lifespan longer than that of normal humans, however, we don't know how long she had lived prior to dying during the Cataclysm, where the intrusive thoughts won and she was turned to James McAvoy. Right, Miko. While almost always being very diligent, they, they, <laughs> they. While almost always being very diligent about her duty as the overseer of both the Grand Larukami Shrine and the Yai Publishing House, Miko often finds herself enjoying the natural sights of Inazuma and just being in the city, visiting the stores and whatever else foxes do on their day off. Expect hunters, pigeons. That's my only food source. I'll show you, you 
dumb bitch. A long, long, long time ago, back when humans didn't use the term long time ago for the time frame in question, Miko, Saigu, and other yokai often gather to feast together and tell each other about the latest exploits throughout Inazuma. Miko looks back fondly on these times, 500 or so years on, after becoming a proper yokai herself and watching the bloodlines of her and her friends grow thinner with each passing day. As an example of yokai mischief, let me mention another friend of Miko, Urakusai, who we meet during her story quest. At one point, this guy enraged the Kitsune Saigo so much that she then banished him to some unknown place and, speculating a connection from Urakusai to the Abyss, she moved to Denshukaku in order to stay closer to A. But that's not even it. Eventually, Uramaki died and his spirit was absorbed by the Ley Lines, remaining dormant until recently when he decided to possess Tomoyuki Decided, he just decided he wants to. A novelist pleading for someone to help him write an amazing novel. He then wrote this guy's as a novel, a literal incantation to summoning spirits, which then the people of Inazuma tried and got possessed by Uraraka's fellow spirits, enabling them to walk on Inazuma for a couple of days before we came in and crashed the party. Well, that was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Demons possessing other people and all that? I wish there was a demon in Genshin. Staying somewhat in the same vein as the previously mentioned characters, it's now time to talk about our favorite My Chemical Romance reject, another illuminated beast from Liwa, the 5'3 demon slaying legend himself, Xiao. Xiao is a name bestowed unto an illuminated beast previously called Aladus by Morax. In Aladus's youth, he was enslaved by some ancient god and was forced to perform cruel acts on his behalf, like kicking puppies on the street and watching Sing and Sing 2. Back to back. This god's reign came to an end, however, when Morax defeated during the Archon War. Aladus was then freed and received the name Xiao from Morax, and as a sign of gratitude, swore to protect Liwa and his people for the rest of his life. So far in this video, the only limited beasts I mentioned were Ganyu and Yanfei, who are not adept entirely but are nevertheless directly related to them. However, you should know that Xiao doesn't follow this pattern, something which is evident by his lack of animal features, and is instead a full adeptus and a yaksha. He's also the only Liwa 5 star I don't have. Well, actually, it's him and Shanhei and probably Yilan as well, but shut up. Ya yeah, mom. Yakshas are adepti, but not all adepti are yakshas. That is the case because they were a select group dispatched by Morax to subdue the evil spirits that once played the Liwe region, thus being also referred to as Guardian Adepti. There were originally five foremost yakshas, one of which included Yao. These five foremost yakshas weren't exactly born yakshas, however, they were regular illuminated beasts who answered to Morax's call to suppress the lingering power of fallen gods. Other known members include the four remaining foremost Yakshas, Posatius, Menagius, Indarius, and Bornana. And also probably the most known one, Pervasis, due to him appearing in Xiao's story quest. The Yakshas are speculated to somehow predate the Seven Elements system established by the Seven. In the Tuesday trilogy for the Yakshas, not only do they resemble only five out of the Seven Elements we are familiar with, but the symbols throughout their characters seem to be cruder and less like the ones currently seen in Teyvat. For example, this vision-like piece which the Hydro Yaksha, we don't know who is who yet precisely, uses has an icon that resembles literally anything apart from Hydro, so yeah, take it as you will, I have no idea where I'm going with this information. Also, according to this same video, we know that only one of the foremost Yakshas is currently confirmed to be alive, that being little Xiaoman over there. Three of the other ones died, while the last one is presumably missing and not confirmed to be dead. Additionally, one of these Yakshas who succumbed to the darkness is theorized to be within the underground areas of the chasm, but we never managed to find them, so NO ONE CARES! No, 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 no fucking way! No way! No way! Nowadays, Xiao still follows his duty as a demon slayer after swearing his life to Morax and Liwa. However, even if his past is a dark and mysterious one, he still prefers that people don't feel sympathy for his actions, and believes that the other Yakshas would also find it insulting. Hence, Xiao remains to prefer secluded from contact with most other beings. Despite still suffering from the karmic debt imposed onto all of the Yakshas, Xiao is surprisingly resilient to its corruption while everyone else has given in and died. Thus, he rarely involves himself in the moral affairs and whenever he does, he asks to get straight to the point for everyone else's sake. He almost succumbed to it at one point but was saved by the music Venti played during one of his visits to Liwa. He also really likes Salmon Tofu. I didn't know where to put this. And I also don't know how to end this segment. Diona Catsline is a bartender at the Cat's Tale who absolutely hates bartendering. Did you know that 80% of people worldwide hate their jobs? But most importantly, it features distinct and especially real cat ears looking at Yuka Ching and Tail. She is also the only non human playable character whose parents, well, dad at least, we know personally and can actually interact with right here in Springvale. 
Tyrone's dad is Draf, a renowned hunter and also descendant of the Castline lineage, which just means kitty in German. Said lineage or family is known to have been in Springville for at least 300 years, the last moment a Genshin Impact player touched some grass, given that in Zhang Lin's story quest we saved an ancient member from the Castline bloodline, bloodline, the Castline bloodline who's been frozen in a cave for that many years. By the way, since Tyrone has pink hair, who's her mother? Is it Yaimiko? Ogura Mio? Look at it, it looks like raw pork. They have always been well known not only for their feline appearances, but for their feline everything else's, like being naturally gifted with agility, dodging and climbing skills, possessing the ability to see well in the dark, and distinguished archery capabilities. Just like real cats. These features, however, are exceedingly rare in both Mondstadt and the rest of Teyfad, leading to a study being conducted by Dr. Edith in studies of bloodlines strange and unfamiliar. Even rarer than that, though, is a castline member with a vision, of which Sayona is the only one, no matter how much she wants to tell you otherwise. She is an incredibly popular bartender at the currently unavailable for some reason cat's tail, for all the wrong reasons. Well yeah, Margaret employed Tyone at the cat's tail because, well, she's really cute and also a cat, it goes well with the vibe. But in reality, Tyone hates alcohol because her dad is a raging alcoholic, and has been employed in a bartering position in one of Mondstadt's top taverns, rival to the Angel's share, in order to secretly execute her plan of demolishing the wine industry in the nation because her dad is a raging alcoholic. Good job, Draft. you just ruined your kid's childhood. It's a great plan though, right? Well, one small issue. Nothing she makes ever tastes bad. It's honestly ridiculous and a bit silly. You'd think this girl would start using this for her benefit, right? And give up on this petty and quite frankly unreachable dream of toppling the alcohol industry. Let's face it guys, this is never gonna work, we've already gone over this in the past, like being a participant of Masterchef or something or establishing her own brand, but no. She continues trying to make the most terrible, disgusting, undrinkable well drinks, which somehow always wind up tasting divine and never learns her lesson. Nevertheless, Diona being hired by Margaret at the Cat Steel did indeed have an impact on the wine industry. It's just that the Dawn Winery's monopoly on alcoholic drinks was literally broken overnight and now actually has competition. Oh my god, if it's not the consequences of my own actions, who would have thought? You got to wonder then, is this a blessing or a curse? It's a blessing, the wiki says so. The reason as to why every drink Diana creates tastes so good is because when she was 7, she befriended an oceanid. Of course, not the hydro oceanid, but one called the Spring Fairy. The Spring Fairy allegedly spring came from Fontaine to Springvale, permanently spring staying after the previous hydro archon ceased to be. According to legend, this Spring Fairy is a really powerful entity which can benefit those around it. In one of Springville's many spring tales, the spring fairy long ago served the spring mother and her sickly spring son by filling a certain barren place in Monsat with water and forming a spring, which instantly healed the child. Rumor quickly spread and thus a settlement formed around this spring, nowadays known as Springvale. This is probably why only the water in Springvale didn't become bitter when the oceanid of Jinxed tried to destroy Endora in version 1.4. Diona then found out about the Spring Fairy when the latter revealed itself on Diona's 7th birthday, giving her the weirdly specific blessing of making all her drinks taste delicious no matter what. Diona of course denies that because what use would that ever be to a 7 year old and because the Spring Fairy has refused to ever show up again, she decided that it was all just a dream and that she is cursed, not blessed, by something else entirely. Uh, what else? Um... Oh yeah, she once physically assaulted a bartender at the Angel's Chair and constantly tries to poison her customers. Why isn't there a prison in Mondstadt? But what use would a cat be without, well, a dog? Remember this cartoon? <laughs> Goro is one of the characters ever. Look, me being unfamiliar with this character is the understatement of the century, even if he does support my favorite character in the game better than any other 4 star, I just haven't gotten around to using him yet. I haven't even done his the hangout event. Goro was once just a common Watatsumi resistance soldier and a loyal Sangonomiya supporter, but has since risen through the ranks to become one of the most prestigious leaders, acting as the army's primary general under Kokomi's trust. And look, I searched all over the internet to Google searches, and everyone still seems to disagree on whether Goro is a fox or a dog, since both are canines, but hey, let me say what I think. Goro is a dog, not a fox. And here's why. <gasps> 
<laughs> Nowhere in Goro's character is there ever seen anything related to foxes. The wiki states that he has dog blood flowing through his veins. Whenever he is exceedingly happy, his tail starts wagging. He can mostly understand what dogs are trying to say from a single bark. He has an aversion to onions, which is a reference to how dogs can't eat onions in real life because they're poisonous. The underside of his tail is white, like most Shiba Inu. His constellation is in the shape of a Shiba. His name card features a Shiba. <gasps> and his constellation's name is Canis Blatorius, which literally means warrior dog. Woo! Goro was revealed by name before Inazuma was even released by Kazuha, and is curiously one of the few Inazuma playable characters not to have a surname, second name, or even a clan name because he is a lone wolf dog. Goro is an army general, and therefore requires a strong will, perseverance, and determination in the many battles he's fought and won during his time as a soldier. So even at a young age, he figured that the best steps he should take in order to become an efficient leader are always remembering his prime objective, fighting tooth and nail to attain it, and always sharing the best possible relationship with your allies all of which he excels at. During a certain special operation in the past, when Goro was just a rangy daddy in an alley called George, him and everyone else were stuck in a bit of a pickle as their leader had just been killed by an arrow. Guess he couldn't outsmart Bullet. Countless options appeared in the soldiers' minds, but nay, said Goro, probably, as he rejected all of those and instead came up with a plan. Lead a larger portion of the team in a fake attack and buy time for the others to call in reinforcements in the Watatsumi Army Discord server. After days of fighting, Kokomi herself arrived, threw a jellyfish and promoted Goro to Captain of George. From there, he would continuously rank up to the position he is in now. He also has a canonical explanation as to why he's a support and not a DPS. Goro often used to think that, were he a little bit stronger and not 5 foot 3, maybe he would have been able to turn the tide of battle in his favor. Hence, he would often practice his archery day and night, until he noticed that it isn't only the individual strength that makes someone great, but how cooperation and unity could be used by inferior troops to plow through their enemies. Realizing this, Goro no longer pursues to be an excellent archer, but instead uses his time to help those around him as a troop is only unbeatable if they truly stick together. That's when some random German elf girl comes around and blows everything up with a duel. Let me see what you have! I'm going! No! What? You thought I was joking when I said German. <laughs> I'm never joking. No, literally. Klee means clover in German. But we're getting too ahead of ourselves here. Klee and Diona are literally the entire reason as to why I'm making this video as. If they weren't mentioned in one of the icebergs I reviewed a few videos ago, no one would even suggest that I made this video, so great, let's talk about Elvis! It should be apparent from just looking at her ugly mug that Klee has ears. More specifically, elf ears, which are so far exclusive to her and her mom, Alice. Although we've never seen Alice's appearance and neither of them are outright confirmed to be elves, we can basically confirm they are due to their ears and to being in a different group of beings from the rest of the world with a much, much longer lifespan, just like Elvis in fiction. So until the devs reveal the real name of the race, let's just keep calling them elves for the sake of it. Despite being a literal bumbling infant, Klee has already amassed quite a name for herself in Monset for all the wrong reasons. She's an official knight of Favonius because why the fuck not, I guess. <coughs> but most notably features an extreme fascination with everything that explodes, which earned her the title of most powerful within the Knights of Favonius, quotation marks, by those who have never seen her. Fitting, right? She's just a kid who doesn't know the extent of her actions and likes to play around with dangerous things she doesn't know are dangerous. Due to all of this, however, she can often be found put in solitary confinement by Jean, something which should also happen to Diona. She loves everyone in the city, apart from Diluc because he is grumpy and also has a massive forehead, and is especially fond of Kaya and Albedo, the latter of which she takes to as an older brother of sorts. Klee is known to create her own bombs because giving children unmonitored access to gunpowder is always a good idea, and which are somehow really fucking strong. And also, like most pyro characters in the game with one glaring exception, she is extremely hyperactive. Really, what's with pyro characters and not being able to sit down for two seconds? As I mentioned before, Klee is German for clover, something which in this case makes sense as four leaf clovers are scattered all throughout her character, in her clothing, backpack, burst, constellation, constellation's name, and even attacks. However, I don't know why that is specifically. It's pretty widely known that four leaf clovers are related to luck and fortune throughout many countries, one of them being Germany. But Klee doesn't really have any luck elements in her character per se. So I tried to look up a possible relation, something between elves and a four leaf clover, and Nope, still nothing. So, wait. Th this couldn't be it. Is Klee. Is Klee Irish? Top of the morning, Jelani! Klee is one of the oldest five stars in the game, and by that I mean she was literally released in 1.0, right after Banshee's banner, and also had a rerun in 1.6, and I still never managed to get her. So I had to wait for a fucking grave digger to get a rerun, and hope for a 50 50 to get a decent pyro DPS. I hate Hotel! And then there's Chunky! He's dead. Last, and most definitely least, we have the 50-50 destroyer, the drink-consuming zombie herself, Chi-Chi. 
First name... 7-7. Seven, seven. Remember when we used to think Chi-Chi was one of the best characters in the game back in the day? When she's quite basically not even stronger than Barbara in base healing capabilities just because she's featured on a permanent 5-star pool. Oh, the good days. Reminds me of when we wouldn't farm for substats and only main stats and didn't have any fluidity between our team comps. Ironically, no one wants Chi-Chi anymore. Please, God, just l let me get Dilu. I have four Chi-Chi's. I think it's four. Not saying she's bad, though. Like, I may Noel. I'll be the first one to tell you you can make any character good by learning their strategies and farming the right artifacts. It's just funny that, at release, a lot of people just instantly put Chi-Chi on a pedestal because she's a 5-star, and I bet at least 20% of those people didn't even know she's a healer. But nowadays, most seem to not use her in exchange for significantly better options, both in ability and cost, like Bennett. Except for Chi-Chi Mace. You guys are the real chats. Chi-Chi's backstory is as follows. Once upon a time there was a small girl who was a girl and real and collected herbs because that's what young kids did in the medieval ages, I guess, and accidentally wandered into the realm of the Adepti. How? Then she fell and broke her leg. The end. After hiding in the cave to rest and treat her wounds, she could hear sounds spreading to an unknown conflict between eliminated beasts, one of which included mountain shapers, so we could probably infer that this battle was related to the Archon War, meaning Chi-Chi is actually thousands of years old, which doesn't justify any weird actions, you nasty ass motherfucker. In the last moments of her life, I guess you could say she was left for dead. The Adepti understood that she was just a dumb brat who was caught in the crossfire. Again, how? Therefore, the Adepti each imparted a portion of their strength, meaning that Chi-Chi is both dead, alive, and related to the Adepti in order to reawaken her. She did indeed get Defib back to life, but went into a berserk state so hard you could swear she was a child man using the rust. Therefore, Mountain Shaper had no choice but to seal her in the same orange amber currently seen uh, throughout Liyue. For hundreds of years, Chi Chi was just there, in crouching sleep until she was discovered by humans and brought to Wang Shan for a proper burial. The roads were so bumpy, however, that she woke up, broke the amber, escaped, and started following her herb picking patterns out of instinct. That was when she crossed paths with Baijiu, who has since taken her in despite her amnesia. And knowing this guy, he's probably trying to use her to find the secret to immortality, which is where these theories come in. This guy does not care, why is she still with him? Despite being a zombie stuck in the same position for such a long time, Chi Chi has been able to remain somewhat articulated due to a strict calisthenics regime. That's not a joke. Her appearance, however, is forever stuck in this state, just like her facial expressions. And she is known to have a memory so shit, it's like coffee. Coffee shit's what I'm trying to say. Due to her bad memory, she carries with her a sort of dummy's guide on how to properly exist, featuring what she needs to do on the daily and mental exercises, making me wonder what will be of this role whenever she loses this thing. However, despite all of these shortcomings, eh, short, because she's a child, she is easily able to release the adeptal energy she usually suppresses when in battle, in order to increase her strength, speed, and surprise opponents who mistake her for a pebble on the road. That's why kids should never judge someone by their appearance, but instead ridicule them for their hobbies. Well, that about does it for today's video. Obviously, I couldn't go extremely in-depth about every single detail and every single character because I have limited time on this earth, and that's not even including non-human NPCs, but Nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed this glorified compilation of character trivia. Honestly, I think the best thing you can take away from this video is that X-Internet Gecko is the best game ever.